Hello, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started this evening. Welcome to our October Ivy Talk. I am Susie Farmer, the Education Director at the Ivy Creek Foundation. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you all this evening. Um, tonight, we will be learning about the Virginia Bird Atlas and um, more, about bird more about the bird conservation that's taking place here in Virginia. Our speaker is Sergio Harding, who holds a master's degree in biology from Virginia Tech. He has worked as a non-game bird conservation biologist with the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources since 2005. Um, he oversees various avian projects and coordinates with other agencies on bird conservation issues. He is also the Virginia coordinator of the North American Breeding Bird Survey and regularly participates in avian surveys. These have included breeding land bird surveys of wildlife management areas, as well as surveys of bald eagles, pentagon falcons, golden winged warblers, loggerhead strikes, and breeding marsh birds. I'd like to thank him so much for joining us this evening and for doing this talk for us. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. Um, this is being recorded and it will be posted to our website in a few days. Um, please mute yourself if you have not done so. And uh, if you have questions, please put those in the chat box and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, and now I will turn it over to Sergio. Well, thank you, Susie. Uh, I'm good with the uh, screen sharing. You can see everything all right. Looks good Great. to me. Um, well, thanks for the invitation to give this Ivy talk. I really appreciate it. I always um, appreciate the, the opportunity to come out and, and talk a little bit about the uh, bird conservation work that we uh, do as an agency. Um, as I was telling Susie, if my voice drops in volume as I'm talking, uh, just holler and, and I'll... Uh, you know, I'll raise my voice. So today I'm here to talk to you about one of the largest and most exciting bird projects that we currently have going on, which is the Second Virginia Breeding Bird Atlas, and which we are doing in partnership with the uh, Virginia Society of Ornithology and Virginia Tech. But I'm gonna first start by just uh, saying a few uh, brief words about my agency and, and about what we're about uh, to help put the atlas in the context of our broader conservation work. So we are the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. Uh, we were established in 1916, so we're just over 100 years old. I know I don't personally look it, so thanks. Um, DWR, uh, that's our acronym, is Virginia State Wildlife Agency. Uh, every state in the United States has a state wildlife agency. And these agencies were established in response to overharvesting of many of our wildlife populations. And because of that, we are charged with regulating and managing Virginia's wildlife resources. So we have a threefold mission uh, to conserve, connect, and to protect. So we worked to conserve and manage wildlife populations and the habitats that they depend on. We work to connect people to Virginia's outdoors through uh, wildlife related uh, activities. And we work to protect people and property through safe outdoor experiences and by managing human wildlife conflicts. And the work that I myself do as a non-game bird conservation biologist falls squarely within the conserve and connect aspects of our mission. Now, focusing specifically on birds, um, you may be familiar with a study that came out in 2019 that estimated that close to 3 billion birds have been uh, lost from the US and Canada since 1970. So that's a pretty staggering figure. That means we have 3 billion fewer birds out on the landscape today than we did 50 years ago. And the study was very effective in helping to get the word out uh, on, on the plight of our birds uh, to the general public. But of course, as a state wildlife agency, we have long been aware of the decline of many of our bird species and have been working to reverse these declines. Um, now, although habitat loss is, uh, is a big driver of bird population declines, it's certainly not the only factor that contributes to those. Um, there is a complexity of factors that often interact with one another and act in concert. And so these are complex issues to resolve. And so as an agency, we take a multifaceted approach 
uh, toward conservation. And I have some of these programs uh, that my agency engages in uh, listed on the slide. So keep these in mind as I will uh, get back to the slide later in the presentation. So ever since our inception, we have been working on bird conservation. Of course, in the early days, that had to do with species that were hunted or game birds. Uh, so primarily waterfowl, as well as upland game birds like turkey and quail and grouse. Uh, but since at least the early 1970s, uh, we've been very engaged in the conservation of a variety of non-game bird species as well. And this slide just is supposed to give you a, a taste of the, the taxonomic variety of the, of the birds that we work with. So they, they've ranged from shorebirds to colonial water birds, such as gulls, terns, herons, and egrets, to secretive marsh birds like rails and bitterns, uh, and to a variety of land birds uh, like raptors, uh, individual priority species like the uh, federally endangered red cockaded woodpecker, as well as a number of songbirds. And so this brings us back to the Atlas as kind of an umbrella um, uh, um, project that encompasses all of these birds and many, many more as um, we have over 200 breeding bird species in Virginia. So I'm gonna give you a brief introduction to the Atlas. I'm gonna share some preliminary results. I'm gonna give you a sneak peek at some of the products that will come out of the Atlas. And then I'm gonna bring it all back to conservation, how the Atlas is a bird conservation tool for the 21st century. So like a road atlas, at heart, a breeding bird atlas is a collection of maps, uh, except that these maps deal with bird distributions. And by distributions, I mean where they are found on the landscape. So the Virginia Atlas specifically shows the distribution of Virginia's breeding bird species. So here you can see some examples of uh, recent atlas Breeding Bird Atlas publications from some neighboring states, as well as the cover of uh, the first Virginia Breeding Bird Atlas, which took place in the 1980s. So we are really fortunate here in Virginia in that we have a wide variety of habitats that range from coastal habitats all the way to the mountains and everything in between. And we have birds that are distributed across all of these habitats. And understanding these bird distributions, where these birds are found, is, is key to their conservation. So the overarching goal behind the, uh, the second atlas was to generate and disseminate information that has conservation value for Virginia's birds. And we have four overarching object objectives. The first is to take a current snapshot of the distribution of uh, Virginia's breeding bird species. Uh, and to do this, uh, we collected data from 2016 to to, to 2020. So like a lot of other um, states uh, doing BBAs or breeding bird atlases, we gave ourselves five years in order to attempt to cover as best as we could uh, the entire state. Uh, secondly, we wanted to uh, characterize the changes in distribution of uh, individual bird species since the first uh, Virginia breeding bird atlas, which took place between 1985 and 1989. And uh, that was a project, again, of uh, my agency in partnership with Virginia Society of Ornithology, or VSO. And, oops, sorry. And uh, so the idea behind that is that bird distributions can change and do change over time. And tracking these changes can give you insights into the uh, into how bird populations are faring. So for example, if a, if a distribution of a, a bird species is shrinking over time, that's a good clue that the population is probably on the decline. We also wanted to estimate abundance, and by abundance I mean number of birds on a species by species basis and figure out where in the state individual species are more or less abundant, which also ties in with conservation. And finally, we wanted to engage with volunteers on collecting scientific information and on a broad conservation message. So it's important to note that volunteers collected the bulk of the Atlas data uh, that made it possible for us to um, accomplish the first three objectives. So we owe them an enormous debt of gratitude. And following that train of thought, uh, although my presentation is an Ivy talk, I, I wanna give a shout out to the Piedmont Virginia Bird Club uh, for their contributions to the Atlas. Uh, I hope that at, at, least some of the, uh, at least some of the club 
club's members that participated in the Atlas are here today. I don't know if that's the case. If not, I hope that they uh, have an opportunity to view the recording of this video. So in talking with our Atlas coordinator, Ashley Peel, uh, I know that individuals within the club made substantial contributions to the data collected for the Atlas as a whole. So I wanna acknowledge the club's contribution and give a heartfelt thanks. And I also wanted to formally uh, thank uh, some individual club members who went above and beyond. So we have Susan and Guy Babineau. Uh, they uh, not only did they collect massive amounts of data, but they also helped coordinate volunteers and co-hosted volunteer training events with Ashley. And Guy is also on the VSO's board of directors, which is kind of overseeing this phase of the Atlas from a financial perspective. I also want to thank uh, Janet Paisley and Eve Gage. I've never met them, never talked to them, but I understand that in addition to their data contributions, uh, they were instrumental uh, in their work with the Blue Ridge uh, Young Birders Club and getting them involved in the Atlas. I also want to thank Dan Beaker. Uh, he was the VSO president uh, from the summer of 2019 to the summer of 2021. So that was a period that oversaw a uh, transition uh, from the Atlas wrapping up data collection and going into data review and beyond. And so I wanna thank Dan for all of his work on behalf of the Atlas. And I also understand that the Piedmont Virginia Bird Club has sponsored its club's logo species, the Northern Mockingbird, uh, through the VSO's Sponsor Species Fundraising Campaign. And this campaign is designed to get us over the finish line and get these results published. So it's great to, to see the, um, Piedmont Virginia Bird Club continuing to support the Atlas, even at this stage on uh, so many levels. Uh, if I were there in person, I would call for a round of applause to the Piedmont Virginia Bird Club for all of your contributions to the Atlas, but I would do it myself, so thank you. So the three primary uh, partners overseeing the second Atlas were my agency, uh, the Virginia Society of Ornithology and the Conservation Management Institute at Virginia Tech. But there were a myriad of partners that were involved in this effort, um, some in terms of opening up their lands for surveys uh, by volunteers and others uh, in terms of providing personnel to help with data collection. So contributing volunteers themselves. So I just wanna acknowledge all those partners that, that contributed to the success of the Atlas in this slide. Um, so the Atlas consists of two phases. So we had data collection, which, uh, as I mentioned, wrapped up in 2020. And we're currently in the data analysis and publication phase. Uh, this is ongoing, and it's going to culminate in the um, publication of Atlas results as a, a freely, freely accessible website by the fall of 2025. So I'm going to spend a few minutes now talking about phase one, the data collection phase. Uh, beginning with a quick primer on Atlas methodology to better help you understand the products that are going to come out of the Atlas. And some of you uh, that are here today or that may be viewing this presentation uh, later uh, may already be familiar with this material, but please bear with me. It's going to be pretty quick, and I just want to make sure that those who may not have participated in the Atlas or not know much about it understand all of this. So starting with the very basics, here's a map of Virginia with county boundaries. And here is a grid of what we call Atlas blocks. So you see we have Atlas blocks covering the entire state. And an Atlas block is basically a survey unit, meaning that that is where the surveys uh, took place. And moving forward, uh, when we talk about species distributions and I present maps to you, uh, the maps are going to show these species distributions at the Atlas block level. Um, so it's not going to show individual points in terms of a species was confirmed breeding in this particular park. It's, it's going to do it at this broader scale, the Atlas block. So what is an Atlas block? So the U.S. Geological Survey has a series of topographic maps that cover uh, all of the United States. And you can see those in, uh, in there are these black rectangles. And basically, we've subdivided these into six. That's those red grids. And so a block is basically one sixth of a US uh, GS uh, topo map. And each block is roughly nine square miles in size. So if we were meeting in person, uh, this is what the block that we would be standing in looks like. It's known as the Charlottesville East Northwest block. And the pink uh, 
dot would be our physical location, the Ivy Creek uh, natural area. So in terms of methodology, basically volunteer atlasers would conduct surveys within a block and report the birds that they uh, detected. Uh, and they paid special attention to the behaviors of birds because those behaviors were clues as to whether a species was actually breeding within a block or was just migrating through or was finishing off its winter staying and, and close to leaving. So observers would then assign these standardized breeding codes to their, uh, to their observations. And we had 21 different codes. To give you some examples, uh, breeding code, code could be a singing male, or if uh, an observer saw a male and a female together for most species that would indicate a breeding pair, uh, or they might uh, see courtship or copulation or uh, find a nest or maybe see um, fledged young, young that had left the nest. And so based on these behaviors and the, these breeding codes, we could then say that a species within a particular block uh, was a possible breeder, a probable breeder, or a confirmed breeder. So going back to those examples I just gave, um, the singing male would be an example of a possible breeder, uh, the, breeding, the, the pair would be uh, probable breeders, and the nest and the fledged young would of course be uh, confirmed breeding evidence. So observers entered their data into eBird. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with eBird, just really quickly, it's a website, uh, also comes in an app that's run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which allows birders to track their bird observations and to share them in, uh, in real time, essentially, with a global audience. It's free, it's accessible to anyone, you just need to set up an account. And we had Cornell build us a special um, portal uh, specific to the Atlas uh, to the breeding bird atlas for Virginia, uh, within which observers could, volunteers could store their observations. And here you see a screenshot of what that portal looks like. Uh, so for each survey that they conducted within a block, an observer would report the date of the survey, uh, the time of the survey, how long they spent surveying, the specific location within the block that they surveyed, and how, um, as well as the highest breeding code for uh, each species within that block on that particular visit. And so let's say that uh, you had a volunteer that went out to uh, a local park and uh, they conducted a survey and found four uh, cardinals, northern cardinals. So they would put in their, uh, when they reported those data, they would list all four cardinals. Now let's say that three of those cardinals were singing males, but they also saw a female on a nest. So they would report the highest breeding code for the cardinal as ON, meaning on nest, which is confirmed breeding. Uh, so if you go to eBird, the eBird portal, the way it displays is a little bit different from the way that um, the Atlas portal displays in that the, the symbology is a little bit different. So here I've pulled up all Acadian flycatcher Atlas records that were submitted through the portal. You can see the block boundaries here uh, in white and in gray. Uh, and each pin is an observation of a Cadian flycatcher. And uh, pins with an O mean that the species was observed, but there was no evidence of breeding. The Ps are uh, possible breeders, the Rs are probable breeders, and the C, the red C, means uh, the species was confirmed as a breeder. And so you can see we have a, a confirmed breeding of a Cadian flycatcher at uh, Ivy Creek. And if uh, you were to go into eBird and click on this Red Sea, you would see uh, more details of all the observations that went into that report. And you can see that in June of 2018, uh, Guy and Susan Babineau uh, confirmed the species as, as a breeder. ON means occupied nest and NY means nest with young. So uh, we had essentially a small army of volunteers, between 1,400 and 1,500 volunteers who uh, conducted surveys across the entire state. Uh, these folks included birders and bird clubs, uh, college professors and their students, uh, natural resource professionals, et cetera. And we were really thankful um, and impressed by that level of participation. And these volunteers were no slouches. They worked very hard over the course of five years that they logged uh, over 80,000 survey hours in the field. And none of this would have been possible uh, were it not for our amazing 
uh, Atlas coordinator, Dr. Ashley Peel, working out of Virginia Tech. Uh, she put together all the Atlas materials and she recruited regional coordinators to help with uh, volunteer coordination. And she pounded the pavement to uh, recruit and train volunteers and also put out nonstop communications during the five year data collection period. And she also helped to hire and coordinate uh, paid field technicians to conduct point count surveys across the state to complement the uh, volunteer data, as well as to collect data on bird abundance. So as you can tell, this was a tremendous effort and it, it uh, um, resulted in over 10 million individual birds being reported. And this led to almost 725,000 breeding bird records. And by a breeding bird record, I mean a species at a particular location on a particular date, as well as an additional 710,000 uh, bird records that did not have sufficient breeding evidence by Atlas standards. In addition, we had many previously unburdened regions uh, in the state making onto the map. So basically I'm talking about uh, regions that have uh, lower human populations. So fewer birders out there, uh, but by spreading our effort across the state, volunteers were able to collect good data for some of these um, areas that previously had virtually no data at all. So Ashley's role has shifted from Atlas to coordinator to analyzing the data. And she's reviewed all of the data collected that's resulted in these 725,000 breeding bird records. <clears throat> and uh, she is now conducting summaries and analyses of these data. And her work is ongoing, but I do wanna share with you some preliminary results. And I'm gonna start by talking about newly confirmed breeders, uh, breeding species since the last atlas, starting with Van Hinga. Uh, this is a water bird uh, that has historically bred south of Virginia. It was first confirmed breeding in Virginia in 2009, but then not again until 2017 during the atlas period. Uh, and it's been confirmed as a breeder during the Atlas uh, at five sites in Virginia's Piedmont and Southeast Coastal Plain. Next, we have the handsome Mississippi kite. This is a raptor uh, that's also a more southerly breeder. So as of 1987, we had only eight or so site records of the species for all of Virginia, and none of them were breeding records. Uh, the kites were first documented breeding in Virginia in the mid-1990s. So well after the first atlas ended in 1989, but records were still very few at that point. But since that time, the population has really continued to grow so that through the current atlas, we've documented breeding at uh, over 30 sites, including in Northern Virginia, Virginia Beach, the greater Richmond area, as well as the broader coastal plain and Southern Piedmont. Next is the black necked stilt. This is a long legged shorebird. Uh, in the eastern U.S., it's, it's found along the coast, again, uh, south of Virginia. Uh, we do have a limited number of breeding records for Virginia, some of which actually date back to the 1970s. But again, this is a species that was not picked up in the last atlas. Uh, but during this atlas, uh, it was confirmed with young, both at Craney Island and on the eastern shore. Uh, to switch things up a little bit, we have a more northerly breeder, the yellow rumped warbler, which is associated with the boreal zone uh, of uh, Canada and the northeastern United States, as well as the western U.S. Uh, it's a common wintering bird here in Virginia, especially in the uh, coastal plain, uh, but it was first documented as breeding here in Virginia in the mid-1990s, so a fairly recent breeder. And as a breeder, it is restricted to the mountains of Virginia. And we had confirmed breeding at seven sites for the species during the uh, second atlas. And finally, we have the spectacular painted bunting. Uh, this is also a more southerly breeder. Uh, the northern end of its breeding range until recently was in North Carolina. But in 2017, it was confirmed by the late great Ned Brinkley uh, as breeding on Fisherman's Island National Wildlife Refuge on the Eastern Shore. So he had multiple observations of two singing males over the course of a couple of months. And on one of his visits, he watched for a long time as one of the males flew back and forth uh, to and from uh, a cluster of shrubs. And on a couple of those visits, the bird was carrying a prey item in its uh, bill indicating that it had a nest with young. So 
the majority of the, of the species that I talked about previously really began breeding in Virginia between the first and the second atlas. The painted bunting instead, and this 2017 confirmation of breeding is the first and only that I know of confirmation for the state of Virginia ever. So very exciting that that also happened during the um, atlas period. So just like we've lost um, some, uh, or gained some, some new species as breeders in Virginia since the first atlas, we've also lost some, unfortunately. Uh, this includes the upland sandpiper. This is a shorebird that inhabits um, grasslands. Its stronghold is in the Midwest uh, United States, but it's also found scattered in the Northeast. And Virginia was once the Southern end of its breeding range. Um, it was only confirmed as breeding at a handful of sites during the first atlas some 30 years ago. And at that point, its population had already greatly declined in Virginia. It can still be observed in Virginia and even south of Virginia to this day, uh, but it was last documented as a breeder uh, at a sod farm in Fauquier County in 2002. Next, we have the Buick's wren, uh, which is, so, is associated with shrubby habitats and backyards. So this is a species that expanded its range into the eastern U.S. from the west in the 1800s and early 1900s and has since been extirpated as a breeder across the entire uh, Eastern United States, not just Virginia. Uh, interestingly, its decline corresponds to a range expansion of the house wren, and uh, there's speculation that the two are linked because the house wren is known to um, outcompete uh, Buick's wrens. So at the very least, they may have helped uh, to hasten its decline. And the last uh, Virginia breeding records for Buick's wren uh, were during the first atlas where it was confirmed uh, from two counties and was a probable breeder in the third. And these were all in the Western part of the state. Uh, next, we have another wren, the sedge wren, which is associated with wet meadows and marshes. Uh, its stronghold is also in the Midwest. We actually have breeding records for Virginia for the species that date back to the early 1930s, uh, but there was only one confirmed breeding record uh, in the late 1980s during the first atlas. Um, the species can still be seen here in Virginia during the winter into early spring, especially in coastal areas. And finally, we have the Bachman sparrow, or I think the correct pronunciation is actually Bachman sparrow. So this is a sparrow that's associated with open pine savannas. So just think of a open pine woodland with widely spaced uh, pines, kind of park-like, grassy understory and little in the way of shrubs. Uh, this bird is endemic to the southeastern United States, meaning that it's only found there. That's the only place in the world it's found. And Virginia wants once at the northern end of its breeding range. Uh, the last observation we have of the species in Virginia uh, dates back to 2002. The last potential breeding record uh, was in Southside, Virginia in 1996. And the last actual breeding confirmation was from the first atlas in 1986. So switching gears, I have another set of preliminary results uh, that come from an analysis that Ashley has been conducting on breeding phenology. And by breeding phenology, I mean the timing of the different stages of the breeding cycle. So when is a nest built? When do young fledge or, uh, from a nest? That is, when do they leave a nest? So what Ashley did was she looked at the timing of nesting behaviors, which include nest building, egg laying, and incubation. And she looked at the timing of post-hatching behaviors. And by that, I mean any, anything that involves a hatched young. So it could be nestlings on the nest, or it could be young birds that have already left, left the nest. So uh, she looked at the median dates for nesting behaviors and for post-hatching behaviors, as reported by volunteers. Uh, for the first atlas versus the, versus the second atlas to determine whether uh, any of these behaviors were occurring earlier or later in the second atlas than they were 30 years ago in the first atlas. So she did this for 97 species. She lumped them all together. And overall, she found that nesting behaviors are taking place earlier in the season than they were 30 years ago. And post-hatching behaviors are taking place later in the season. So this isn't true for every single uh, one of the 97 species that she looked like, but when she lumped them all together, that's the general result that she got. So now I'm gonna give you some concrete examples. So this big red line that you see in the middle of the slide, that's kind of ground zero. It indicates no change 
uh, in the timing of breeding behaviors. Anything that you see to the uh, left uh, of the line indicates that those breeding behaviors are taking place earlier uh, now, currently, than they were 30 years ago during the first atlas. And anything to the right of the line means that those behaviors are taking place later now than they were 30 years ago. So to give you some specific examples, this Baltimore Oriole and these blue-gray gnat catchers are on average seen building nests about two weeks earlier now than they were 30 years ago, uh, while red-bellied woodpeckers are seen at completed nests about a month earlier than they were during the first atlas. And on the flip side, you have uh, scarlet tanagers that are being seen with fledglings about two weeks later in the breeding season than they were 30 years ago, and grasshopper sparrows and eastern meadowlarks that are being seen uh, uh, feeding dependent uh, fledged young out of, out of the nest about 19 days and 23 days later in the breeding season, respectively, than they were uh, 30 years ago. Now here are a few more extreme examples. So we have cedar waxwings uh, building their nests over a month earlier than they were 30 years ago, and uh, red-tailed hawks at completed nests about uh, over a month earlier uh, than they were at during the first atlas. Then you have wood thrush feeding dependent fledglings uh, 26 days later in the breeding season than previously, and no northern mockingbirds being seen with uh, nestlings as well as feeding dependent fledglings about a month later. So the, the big thing that I wanna clarify here is that for each of these individual species, we do not have enough data to know whether the species that uh, were nest building earlier also fledged young or produced young earlier, and whether the species that were uh, seen with nestling or fledged young later in the breeding season also nested later. But for a handful of species, we do have this information. So barn swallows, red-winged blackbirds, and northern cardinals were all uh, on average building their nests earlier in the breeding season and fledging young later in the breeding season. So this is a very coarse analysis. Uh, the big picture take home message is that the uh, length of the breeding season appears to have lengthened over the 30 years between the first and uh, second atlases with birds arriving earlier on territory and beginning their breeding activities sooner and with fledglings and parental care of nestlings uh, extending much later into the breeding season. And so there's an obvious disconnect here as you intuitively would think that birds that are building their nests earlier in the season are also fledging young earlier in the season. So one potential explanation is that these earlier nesting attempts are for some reason leading to a greater frequency of nest failures so that the birds are then having to re-nest again in order to pull off a successful nest. And that is why you are seeing nestlings and fledged young later in the season. But that's that's all conjecture at this point. We don't, we don't have all the answers, but I thought that these patterns were interesting enough that they were uh, worth presenting. So now I'm gonna shift gears and talk a little bit about the uh, products that are gonna come out of the Atlas. Uh, again, we are going to be publishing these as a website in the fall of 2025. And the core of the website are gonna be these individual species accounts, uh, one for each of the 200 plus breeding bird species in Virginia. Each account is gonna have a set of maps and figures derived from Atlas data, as well as a written narrative that helps to interpret those maps and figures. And each species account is gonna address breeding distribution, population status, as well as present some ecological information derived from Atlas data. So I am gonna present some of the maps that are gonna be included in the species accounts and specifically show you prototype maps for black-throated blue warbler. Uh, this is a species whose breeding range here in Virginia is mostly restricted to west of the Blue Ridge. Uh, it's associated with high elevation forests with thick shrub cover, evergreen shrub cover in the form of mountain laurel and rhododendron. So as I present you with these maps, the caveat here is that they're very much in draft format. Uh, we have limited capacity and capability <laughs> amongst ourselves to, to produce maps. So they're very amateurish, uh, so to speak. And I can uh, 
guarantee you that the maps that are going to be included on the final website are going to have the input of graphic designers and professional web developers. So don't be too judgmental, please go easy on us. So the first set of maps I want to show you are what we call breeding observation maps. So these basically show all the blocks within which the species was detected uh, with some level of breeding evidence. And you can see that the blocks are color coded. So yellow means possible breeder, orange means probable breeder, and red means a confirmed breeder. Um, and again, this is specific to the second atlas. So these were based on data collected from 2016 to 2020. In addition, we are also gonna be producing maps, uh, the same set of maps for the first atlas. We did put, up, put out an, uh, a publication in uh, the year 2000 or so that fell uh, very short on expectations in terms of what a, a, a published Atlas product should look like. And it includes just a bunch of maps that are in black and white and kind of hard to read. So we're attempting to redeem ourselves by including some proper maps from the first Atlas on this website as well. So this map is a map of Blackthroat Blue Warbler's current breeding distribution in Virginia. It's based on occupancy modeling uh, using Atlas data. And what it does is shows the probability of the species occurring in a particular block within its breeding range. So the difference between this map and the previous set of maps is that these maps just show you where the species was actually detected by human observers. Whereas this map, this modeling map, this occupancy model uh, is a predicted map. It predicts where the species occurs so it extrapolates beyond uh, just where the, where the species was observed. And from that standpoint, it provides us with a better sense of the true distribution of the species because it takes into account underserved areas. So areas that did not receive a lot of survey attention and which therefore uh, might have missed birds that were present. So I just wanna say a few quick words about survey effort. This is a map showing the cumulative survey effort per block uh, over the five-year period. So uh, pay attention to the red blocks. Those are the ones that received the most effort, over 20 hours of effort, some total over the five years. Um, you can see they're very concentrated in, the, in these uh, urban areas. Uh, some of these blocks in Northern Virginia actually received over 100 uh, hours of survey effort. Uh, which was <laughs> very impressive. Uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have these white blocks that received between no survey effort and only half an hour of survey effort. So quite a difference there. Then you have all these other color-coded blocks that correspond to other, um, um, some total of effort that each block received. So the bottom line is you can see there's a wide variation in the amount of effort that, uh, survey effort that any given block received. Um, and this is going to have an impact on the species that are reported for that block. So if you can imagine that a, a species or a particular block has a black throated blue warbler occurring there, there is a much greater probability that that bird will have been, that species will have been detected and reported for a block that received 20 hours of survey effort versus a block that received 20 minutes of effort. So the occupancy model takes into account all of this variation in survey effort uh, when predicting the distribution of the species. <clears throat> so another thing that the occupancy model does is it looks at all of the blocks where the species was detected and it identifies the habitat characteristics that those blocks have in common. So let me help decipher what these different graphs mean. So on the y-axis here, you have the probability of occurrence, the probability uh, between zero and, uh, and 100 that the black throat blue warbler will have been detected in that block. And that's uh, graphed against the four uh, main variables that came up as important for this particular species. So uh, the first variable is percent development. How, how developed is the block? So the more developed a block is, the lower the probability that you'll find the black throat blue warbler there. Um, Topographic heterogeneity simply means if there's a lot of variation in elevation. Uh, so this species uh, likes high elevations. And so uh, it's, this predicts that uh, you have a lower probability of 
finding the species in areas with uh, a lot of um, differences in elevation. So in areas with lower elevations, for example, in blocks that have a lot of low-lying areas. Uh, percent forest cover, so there's a positive association there. So uh, blocks with greater percentage of forest cover have a greater probability of black-throated blue warblers occurring there. And then finally, relative evergreen shrub cover, and that uh, evergreen shrub cover refers again to the mountain laurel and the rhododendron with which the species is associated. So when you have higher shrub cover, uh, you have a higher probability of occurrence. So these relationships here are then used by the model to assign the probability of occurrence of the species to each block based on the characteristics of that block. So what percent forest cover does a particular block have or what percent development? So this is a predictive model. So it also assigns probability of occurrence to blocks that were not surveyed or that had low survey effort. And again, it takes into account the survey effort that I uh, mentioned in the previous slide. So now that hopefully we uh, understand what an occupancy model does a little better, let's go back to this uh, map that I presented earlier. Uh, so here you see blocks uh, color coded based on the probability that a black throated blue warbler occurs within that block based again on the habitat characteristics within that block and on survey effort. So the, um, the very light purple blocks uh, have a, a very low probability between essentially zero and 25% probability of being occupied by a black throated blue warbler. The medium purple have a probability of between 26 and 50%, and the dark purple, a probability of between 50 and 66%. So if you kind of squint your eyes and just focus on the dark blue or the dark purple areas, you can see that they are uh, well associated with high elevation areas. So here you have the spine of the Blue Ridge Parkway that has quite a few blocks uh, with dark purple. You have Highland County on the West Virginia border. You have Shenandoah Mountain in uh, Rockingham and Augusta counties. You have some high elevation areas in, uh, I believe this is Buchanan County, uh, maybe Dickinson, sorry about that. Uh, but anyway, it's coal country. So uh, lots of high elevation areas there as well as uh, in the um, White Top uh, and uh, Mount Rogers area. So we also produced occupancy maps uh, for the species based on the first atlas, and that's what these look like. And then finally, we compared the uh, each individual block for which we could calculate a, a probability of occurrence between the first atlas and the second atlas and calculated how that probability of occurrence had changed for each block. And therefore, this kind of measures uh, the change in distribution for black throat blue warbler between uh, the two atlases. So these purple areas here, the purple blocks basically represent no change. So the population's distribution has remained stable there. The blue areas are uh, areas where there's a lower probability of finding the species um, in the current atlas than there was in the prior atlas. So basically, this is where their range has, has shrunk. They, they're not likely to be uh, found in those blocks anymore. And then the areas in uh, orange are the areas where you have a higher probability, significantly higher probability of finding uh, black-throated blues now than you did 30 years ago. Then I also wanted to mention, so you can see this is the, the breeding range of the species. So of course, it's not showing up. Uh, in the eastern part of the state, just west of the Blue Ridge. But I also wanted to mention all these gray blocks scattered uh, within its breeding range are blocks for which we could not model the probability of occurrence for the first atlas. And that's because unfortunately we had very poor survey uh, effort data for the first atlas. And so since we can, could not predict uh, the uh, percent occurrence probability for those blocks, we could obviously not calculate the change in that probability between atlases. So unfortunately, these are kind of black data holes for us. And finally, I wanted to present abundance maps, uh, which are based on abundance models. And these take occupancy models one step further in that not only do they predict where you're most likely to find um, black-throated blue warblers, but they also predict the areas with 
the highest abundances of bacteria blue warblers. So they're kind of like a heat map. And if you look at the areas that are darker red, those are the areas of the state with the highest abundances. And they track pretty well with occupancy maps. So you can see areas of the Blue Ridge Parkway, areas of Shenandoah Mountain, uh, some areas in Highland County, uh, Mount Rogers, White Top area, and some other high elevation areas in Virginia. So the neat thing about these um, abundance models is they also allow us to calculate population estimates for the species. So for black-throated blue warblers, we have calculated um, roughly 56,000 individuals, that includes both males and females, uh, as making up the breeding population here in Virginia. And that's a pretty low number. Now, the caveat that, that I want to give is that we've also placed confidence limits around this number, meaning that we present a range of numbers from low to high. Uh, and within that, that range, we have 95% confidence that the true population estimate is found. Okay, And so those numbers are uh, a low of 30,000 individuals to a high of about 100,000 individuals, which I realize is a really wide range. Uh, but it still tells us that the population is relatively low because we're 95% confident that it does not exceed 100,000 uh, individuals. All right, so we've collected five years worth of data and uh, in a couple of years, we'll be done analyzing and packaging up the results into an Atlas website. Uh, so what then? So I go back to the title of the presentation, that of the Atlas as an important bird conservation tool because this speaks to how all of this information will be used. Uh, if, if, if the information is not used, then it's of no conservation value. So this is a slide that I put up earlier showing the different components of our uh, wildlife conservation program. It applies equally to birds as well as to other uh, wildlife. So I'm gonna start by talking about how my agency plans on using the Atlas data and products to help uh, us with our uh, bird conservation activities. So as I mentioned, we are a regulatory agency. So we review development and large infrastructure pro projects that require a permit. And we re make recommendations to those projects on avoiding or minimizing impacts to wildlife, especially to threatened and endangered species. And uh, to this day, we continue to use data from the first Atlas to help inform our reviews. So basically project proponents are uh, going into our database and they're conducting a two mile radius search around their project to see if there are any hits on threatened and endangered species. And if they are, then uh, we ask for time of year restrictions during which they can't conduct certain activities because they'll disturb breeding birds, uh, or we'll ask for habitat assessments at the project site to see if the habitat uh, still exists or even species surveys. So again, we're still using pretty old data from the, from the first uh, Atlas. So I'm looking forward to our being able to plug our new uh, Atlas database, uh, our raw data, which tells us exactly where species was observed uh, into these environmental reviews. I think they'll, they'll really help to improve them. So unbeknownst to many, we are a land owning agency and we have a, a, an active land acquisition pro uh, uh, program. So we own and protect in perpetuity over 230,000 acres across Virginia. These are our wildlife management areas or WMAs of which we have 48. So all these red blobs here show you the shape, size and location of our wildlife management areas. So when we go to purchase land, uh, surprise, surprise, we, we don't have very deep pockets. So we often don't have all of the money, all of the millions of dollars required to, to purchase a particular parcel. So we try to pull in outside money by applying to grants. And in order to write these grants, we rely on data that dates back to the first atlas to explain which priority bird species and other wildlife species are found near the parcel and which uh, therefore would be most likely to benefit from our buying that land. And so I really look forward to our being able to use the atlas maps, including, including the breeding observation maps and the occupancy and abundance maps uh, for even better and more up-to-date information to support our land purchase decisions. And uh, in terms of writing these grants, and even uh, I hope to be strategic about what land purchases we pursue. 
Now, once we buy this land, we don't just let it sit fallow. We actively manage our wildlife management areas for wildlife by creating and maintaining habitat. And we base decisions on which priorities bird species to manage habitat for uh, based on our knowledge of whether a species occurs on a WMA or near a WMA. So here are just a few examples of uh, some work that we've done over the past 10 years. So we did a silvicultural treatment, basically thinned the forest to create canopy gaps for cerule cerulean warblers at Gathright WMA, uh, which is in Bath County. So we already had a breeding population of ceruleans at the WMA, and uh, we were able to en enhance that population through uh, the silvicultural work. Um, for those of you who are familiar with red cockaded woodpeckers, you may know that Piney Grove Preserve, owned by the Nature Conservancy, has the primary population of RCWs, as they're known, uh, in the state. That's in Sussex County. So we purchased Big Woods WMA, which abuts uh, Piney Grove, and we've done some aggressive management, habitat management, opened the forest up into pine savanna conditions for the benefit of red cockaded woodpeckers. And in so doing, we expanded the footprint of the habitat that is available for the species. And uh, I think we're four or five years now into having attracted uh, breeding red cockaded woodpeckers on the wildlife management area. So we're very happy with that. And finally, um, Highland Wildlife Management Area is uh, known as a population center for gold wing warblers. Uh, that's Highland County. And so Highland WMA, which sits in Highland County, well, right uh, downslope from the WMA, we have a sizable population of gold wings. So we thought, let's manage uh, these already open areas on the ridgeline for the benefit of gold wing warblers. Between planning and management, that took between five and six years. And uh, just last year, we had uh, a breeding pair show up uh, at the WMA. So we were very happy with that. Um, so we're very excited by our successes and we look forward to using information from the second atlas uh, to guide our decisions to manage habitat for other priority bird species. And uh, I mentioned habitat management because it's uh, important because habitat loss is one of the leading causes of decline for many bird species. So creating new habitat, and maintaining existing habitat is very important to their conservation. Um, so in my mind, education and outreach is an often underappreciated conservation uh, strategy, but it's very important because it helps to build public support uh, and participation in our conservation programs. So I, I personally am biased, but I believe we have a very vibrant uh, education and outreach program. We coordinate the Virginia Bird and Wildlife Trail. Uh, we sponsor and participate uh, in various bird festivals. Uh, we offer various wildlife camps, including the Richmond Falcon Camp. And we put out all kinds of wildlife information on our website and in social media and blog articles. So how does the Atlas fit into all of this? Well, we are going to have the Atlas website, uh, which in my mind is going to be an important education and outreach tool in and of it in and of itself because it will contain uh, a lot of information on over 200 uh, breeding bird species in Virginia. And we plan on promoting the website to a wide variety of audiences in order to get out our conservation message relating to priority bird species. We also as an agency regularly work with K through 12 educators to develop lesson plans that they can uh, deploy in the classroom. And I think the Atlas website is going to be a rich source of information. And uh, my hope is that we will continue, continue to collaborate with educators to draw lesson plans from the Atlas website uh, so that they can be adapted for conservation education in the classroom. And finally, I'm proud to say that we are the only, the first and only uh, state wildlife agency in the nation to have a wildlife viewing plan, which directs us on how to better uh, engage and better serve the needs of our constituents who are wildlife viewers, including birders. And we have learned through this process that uh, a desire of wildlife viewers in terms of engaging with the agency is to volunteer their time toward habitat management. So for example, invasive species, uh, invasive plant species eradication, as well as uh, collecting uh, data in agency sponsored projects. So this can include participating in uh, bird surveys. So we wanna continue engaging, engaging with Atlas volunteers as well as others uh, by providing opportunities to help us collect 
bird data. Uh, so I've already had several Atlas volunteers uh, that uh, have lent their time to the North American Breeding Bird Survey, which I coordinate here in Virginia. And we are looking for other potential bird projects that we can launch to engage with volunteers. In terms of conservation planning, a good chunk of our funding comes from the federal government and one of the requirements we have in order to continue receiving that funding is that every 10 years we update, uh, update our wildlife action plan. And in that plan, we identify what we call species of greatest conservation need, which are basically the priority species that we're gonna spend the next 10, 10 years putting our conservation money and efforts toward. Uh, so we are in the process of revising our wildlife action plan for the second time. So this will be the third edition that will come out in 2025. And uh, so we are currently um, updating our list of species of greatest conservation need. And needless to say, the Atlas data is already proving very valuable in terms of helping us to uh, figure out which bird species should be priorities. I also wanted to mention that though the Atlas is a fantastic source of bird information, uh, it's going to be necessary to dig deeper and collect even more data for particular bird species if we really want to understand what is driving their declines and uh, basically address conservation to those root causes so that we can turn those declines around. And I just see the Atlas as a great starting point for helping to guide us to specific geographic areas where the species uh, are found in uh, high abundances and where we can collect those data. And as a real life example, I have been uh, banding and monitoring loggerhead shrikes here in Virginia since 2015. And when I first started out, I needed to figure out where, where do I go to trap and ban these shrikes. And so I relied heavily on eBird data uh, submitted by uh, birders in order to to figure out where to go and to get my start. So I, in the same way, I see the Atlas data as providing us with jumping off, off points to establish uh, projects for priority species uh, like Swainson's warblers and black-billed cuckoos and breeding northern solid owls. So there are many other things that can be done uh, for bird conservation using the Atlas projects, uh, products I just named just a few, and I really focused on the way that we plan on using these Atlas data and Atlas products. But the one thing that I wanna stress is that our intention is that the Atlas not just be used by DWR or the VSO or Virginia Tech, but that it be used by a wide network of partners that we work with to achieve conservation that we could otherwise not accomplish on our own. So I think, by deciding to publish the Atlas as a website, this makes it a lot more accessible to folks from natural resource agencies and non-governmental organizations and universities, as well as other audiences, than if we had uh, gone with the traditional uh, book route. You know, these atlases tend to be published as coffee table sized books uh, with limited print runs. So in addition to accessibility and longevity, uh, we plan on making the raw Atlas data available uh, by request uh, to researchers who have novel ideas on ways to analyze and use the data beyond what we are doing in, in terms of our map production and occupancy and abundance models. So we really hope that this uh, will further heighten the Atlas's conservation potential. So this is my final slide. If you're interested in updates on the Atlas, you can visit two different websites. So our website at dwr.virginia.gov. Just type Atlas in the search bar and it'll take you directly to the webpage. And I post all the updates that I personally put out on the Atlas can be found there. And then you have uh, the, the VSO's website, virginiabirds.org. Uh, you'll see in the upper left-hand corner, they have a breeding bird atlas uh, drop down, and that'll take you to, to their website, and that's also a great source of information. So as I mentioned, the VSO is currently fundraising for the Atlas project to get us over the finish line as we work toward the publication of the website. So if this presentation has inspired you to further support the Atlas project, uh, the VSO has launched a sponsor a species campaign, fundraising campaign, which you can access through their website. And that is the end of my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions.
if you all have questions, you can just unmute um, instead of writing them in the chat, chat box. So Sergio, this is uh, Carol Heiser. I can't turn my camera on, but it's nice to see you again. Um, I'm just curious if all the other data that gets submitted into eBird, you know, when we're bird watching, if I see a black-throated blue warbler in, you know, Louisa County where I live a week ago, does any of that, um, do you use any of that information or is it, is it really mostly just breeding bird data that's most relevant for the kind of work that DWR does? So first of all, it's nice to hear from you, Carol. <laughs> um, yeah, so I regularly e use eBird. Um, you know, I mentioned that we conduct uh, environmental reviews and look at land acquisitions and that sort of thing. When I'm asked questions about that sort of thing, I, I, I go to eBird uh, beyond what we have in our databases. Uh, my focus for our species greatest conservation need has been largely on breeding observations. But in our current list of priority species, we also have some wintering species. Uh, like uh, American black duck, which also breed here in low numbers, like northern harriers, as well as migrant species, uh, including some shorebirds and some uh, some waterfowl species. So I guess the answer to that is uh, it depends on what our priority species are. And in some cases, uh, we can make use of, of data from any time of the year. Uh, but yes, uh, we are largely focused, generally speaking, on uh, on breeding observations. Cool, thank you. Yep. I don't have a question, but I wanted to show you, I did not plan to wear this shirt tonight. It actually goes with this shirt. And I got all my birding shirts out because I'm headed to Cape May tomorrow for the um, fall festival. But I really, really enjoyed the couple of uh, Atlasing blockbusting weekends. I participated in and it's nice to connect a face with your name so thank great. you great thanks thanks for participating in this presentation and thanks for your work on the atlas we really do appreciate it and enjoy Cape I covered May. a lot i covered a lot of rural underreported <laughs> blocks in my travels especially on the northern neck that's great so, that's great yeah so when you say you provide uh training to volunteers how extensive is the training are you talking about with the Atlas specifically? So that was outside of my wheelhouse. Uh, I was more of a behind the scenes type person. Uh, so Ashley Peel was the person that provided that training. So first of all, uh, you can still visit the original Atlas website. It's just vabba2.org. And so she developed all these uh, handbooks and materials uh, that just kind of give you an overview of the methodology, uh, what how to report different breeding bird behaviors for different species. So for example, wrens building dummy nests may not count as a confirmation of breeding if you see one of those. So there's that training that's available online, but I believe she also really visited a lot of bird clubs and hosted in-person trainings, uh, whether those were presentations or, uh, I think for the most part, there were presentations and during which she would talk about Atlas methodology, she would talk about areas of the state uh, that uh, particularly needed attention because they were under-surveyed or a lot of Atlas survey effort had been focused on, on different areas of the state. Uh, so, uh, and then she also led these blockbusting rallies that Joanne mentioned, uh, where she'd get a group together for a weekend and they would all, you know, I, I think I, I wasn't there. I think you would split up probably, right? In, in, you know, smaller groups and just cover uh, particular blocks. And so she was helping to lead those as well. Uh, so I, I hope that answers your, your question. So um, she wasn't, she, she, I was just going to say, she wasn't training in terms of like bird identification, if that's what you're asking. No. And, and, and we had various skill levels of, of folks that uh, were involved with the, the Atlas. Um, but, you know, all of these are uh, vetted through the eBird reviewers. So if something seemed out of place, it would get flagged and the person would be contacted for more information and not everything was accepted that was um that was submitted um i can speak to it i took one of the trainings uh carolyn um a couple of years into the atlas i think it was two years in 
with Orson Orson uh, Orcutt. Uh, uh, Orson, Orson Orcutt, yeah. Orson Orcutt and Ashley. And we got a little like manual and a binder and we met at a, a really cool place near Warsaw, Virginia. And I think it was, I don't know, included lunch and maybe four or five hours long with lecture. And then we went out and birded in the area and, and groups and kind of talked about it uh, in the field as well. It was pretty good little training. And then, of course, like you said, the Blockbuster weekends, they would put less uh, less trained folks with more trained folks. So you would learn from the people you were walking around with um, um, in your team. Yeah, and my understanding, I've heard stories of the Atlas having been an entry point for uh, quite a few people that had never really birded or birded seriously before. And they just, once they started Atlas and they caught the birding bug and it just kind of took off from there. So that's also, that that also served that function as well, which is great to hear. Yeah. I actually had cause to use the first breeding bird atlas data um, back in the 90s. I worked on a on a report on the Ravana watershed. Um, and I'm just kind of curious. I mean, I, I kind of recall that there wasn't a lot of data for the Ravana watershed. And I'm kind of curious about what the coverage was of the first, you know, for um you know number of volunteers or number of blocks covered or or whatever for the first versus the second atlas that's a very good question i do not have the answer to that i mean i can put up the map if, if you can identify it on the map the map of survey effort so you can see how much survey effort it received in the second atlas uh but i uh, I, I would have to look into it for the first atlas and i mean if you'd like i can do that and you know, contact you, contact you later uh, with it. Uh, that's okay. It, it was really just curiosity. <laughs> I'm not currently working with the data, mm -hmm. but I, I remember, like I said, doing that back in the 90s. Yeah. So thank, were you able to participate in this atlas as, as well? Did you actually participate in the first atlas or you were No, just no, okay. I just used it. I was, I, I was a GIS technician and okay. I uh, um, was actually, uh, we got hold um, of uh, some of the GIS data from the first atlas and uh, gotcha. I was mapping it for the watershed. Okay, great. Do we have any questions in the chat? No, there's some thank yous there. Well, um, well, thank you for the thank yous. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no questions. Um, I had there. one more comment, actually. Um, my learning curve with the Atlas was learning to look at breeding behavior versus try, just trying to identify the bird. You know, the the song of, of, you know, the immature bird and, you know, watching a bird go to and from the same spot. Oh, yeah, there's probably a nest in there. And that, that was really, really helpful as a birder. And I still use it today, you know, when I'm out there looking at birds and, okay, well, what are they doing? You know, why are they there? You know, it, yeah. So I'm really thankful for that too. Yeah, that's that's really great to hear. Well, um, I just want to thank everyone for attending this evening. I want to thank Sergio for doing this talk. It was very interesting. Um, and informative. Thank you all for spending your evening with us. If you haven't been out to Ivy Creek Natural Area and Historic Riverview Farm recently, please do so. We have an abundance of birds uh, and a lot of variety. Um, we will have another Ivy Talk on November 15th, which will be in person at Ivy Creek. Um, it will be a, we'll be viewing doing a documentary about saving the American chestnut um, called A Clear Day Thunder. And we will have representatives from the American Chestnut Foundation there to talk with you. Uh, we will also be having a special event at Ivy Creek and Historic Riverview Farm on October 28th called Farm Day, which is a celebration of the history and future of farming. It is from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. that day, and it is 
family friendly, free and open to the public. And we hope that you all will join us um, in celebrating our history and the future of farming. Um, if you've enjoyed this talk, we would like you uh, we and would like to support what the Ivy Creek Foundation is doing for our community. Um, please consider going to our website and becoming a donor. Otherwise, thank you all for joining us and have a great evening.